So very good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the British Liver Trust webinar on viral hepatitis. Today on World Hepatitis Day, the British Liver Trust joins the call for people from across the UK and the world to act and to raise awareness of hepatitis because hepatitis can't wait. We aim to do that in the webinar today by talking about the features of the common viral hepatitis conditions and about how they are detected and treated. And we have two speakers for you today. You will hear first from Professor Patrick Kennedy, a world-renowned consultant hepatologist and gastroenterologist. And then you'll hear from journalist and documentary maker, David Graham Scott, about his experience of being successfully treated for hepatitis C. You can pop any questions you have for them both or for us here at the British Liver Trust into the question and answer box as we go along. We're going to do our very best to answer as many as we can during the session today. And so without any further ado, I will now pass you over to Professor Kennedy. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this um, British Liver Trust World Hepatitis uh, Day webinar. Um, it is a pleasure for me to be here and I'm going to briefly today give you an overview of um, I'm waiting for the uh, host participant to stop sharing so I can just share my slides. But um, I'm going to give you an overview of viral hepatitis today. Uh, I'm going to talk through, start with hepatitis C, then talk through hepatitis B, um, and then finish on hepatitis delta virus, which I know many of you will um, be familiar with, but it's an area of viral liver disease which has been neglected to date, and we really need to start focusing on that for. Um, future in terms of uh, doing more for our patients. So I am now about to start with my slides and here we go. So <clears throat> as I said, it's a real pleasure to be involved today and I want to start by giving you an overview of, um, oh, my slides are in reverse, apologies. Um, you get a chance to see them twice here. So Again, just giving you uh, a, an overview and probably a facilitating discussion more than anything, because many of you will be very familiar with the areas that I'm going to cover. And I want to start, first of all, with viral hepatitis elimination. And there are some key numbers which are emerging. You know we're working to these 2030 targets. But the latest data to me is really quite sobering. If you look at the circles I've put here over the latest estimates on global hepatitis B infections, at 296 million, which is really quite a, a colossal number, uh, versus 58 million with chronic hepatitis C, just shown below this. And the highlights, I suppose, it being World Hepatitis Day, just to remind us where we are, that there are 1.1 million deaths in 2019, and these are now mainly due to hepatitis B, as we see initial signs of declines in hepatitis C or deaths related to hepatitis C. 3 million new infections, 1.5 million in hepatitis B and 1.5 million in hepatitis C, which I'll come back to a little bit later, but clearly an increased burden in, in chronic hepatitis B and therefore a real necessity to focus more on that in our practice on a daily basis and what we're doing to help patients with chronic hepatitis B. We estimate that 9.4 million people have received HCV treatment, which is really a, an enormous success. And we're going to hear a little bit more about this as we go forward in the webinar with a ninefold increase from the 1 million uh, people treated in 2015. But you don't get away in these slides without coming back to the reality and the reality of 21% of hepatitis C patients being diagnosed with 62% diagnosed receiving treatment and only 10% of those who believe with hepatitis B have been diagnosed with only 22% actually receiving treatment. Hepatitis C has been a phenomenal success and you're going to hear more from David giving the, the patient perspective in, in the next talk. But I want to show you how highly effective treatments are for hepatitis C. And this is really where now we need to move with hepatitis B and where we need to move with Delta in terms of improving treatment efficacies. And you'll see here the SVO rates really are, are, are as good as we could expect, you know, with patients with no or, or, or minimal fibrosis reaching 97% SVORs but even those patients with compensated cirrhosis and decompensated cirrhosis almost reaching SVR rates of 90% with 
which really underlines the progress that we've made in recent years. These are numbers from England because this is where I've got access to numbers quite easily from my colleagues, Graham Foster, Ahmed al Shakawi. And what I'm showing you here is the treatment of patients with hepatitis C since 2015 16 through to 2020 2021. And essentially, we've nearly treated 60,000 patients for, for hepatitis C in this past five years, which again, to me, is a really huge success and something we really should be very proud of in the UK. However, as we are successful in terms of treating with very effective treatments, there's more work which needs to be done. And this really involves, if we're going to meet the elimination targets for 20, 2030, we need to go out, we need to case find, we need to find patients. And this is where I would say the game is changing in hepatitis C, where we need to go out, identify patients, diagnose and treat those patients. And remember, a lot of these people will be unwilling to access services, and this is where outreach programs become critical to the success or our success in terms of meeting the goals or elimination targets. Access to prisons, drug users, homeless people, all these people need to be integrated into uh, support structures and offer treatment and hopefully be able to treat successfully their hepatitis C. And what I'm showing you here is just an array of the various programs which are currently underway, testing in emergency department, non-specialist settings, dispensing of drugs, home delivery, web-based testing, primary care, involving GPs more, trying to get out there and, and, and really, really raise the bar in terms of how we allow patients to access services, allow patients to access treatment, and hopefully offer successful treatment. So many of these you will see much more of in the coming years, because this is where the, the direction will move to in hepatitis C as we try to broaden access and broaden uh, increase the numbers of patients treated. So in the UK, in England, latest estimates are that 89,000 individuals in England uh, with active hepatitis C, as I said to you in my, one of the earlier slides, 60,000 patients treated approximately over the last five years, notably reductions in deaths from hepatitis C and almost a 50% fall in the number of transplants being performed for hepatitis C. These are really remarkable numbers showing the, the, the great success and the great inroads that we've made in hepatitis C. But, and there's a big but here, reinfections occur and hepatitis C transmission rates have not fallen. So we need to be ultra aware um, of hepatitis C and we still need to offer all the, the how would I put it, the broader uh, net to support patients and to support access and to offer treatment in the best way that we possibly can. So while we've made great progress in the last few years, there's still clearly work that we need to do in hepatitis C to keep up those successes and to reach the 2030 targets. Shifting gear, I'm gonna focus on chronic hepatitis B now. And chronic hepatitis B, as I've shown you from one of those earlier slides, now we estimate approximately 300 million people globally with chronic infection. And what I'm showing you on this slide is essentially the disease paradigm starting off with normal liver, the development of chronic hepatitis, the development of scarring, fibrosis, cirrhosis, and of course, any patient who develops advanced liver disease, fibrosis, cirrhosis, and even those without are, risk, are at risk for the development of liver cancer. So the question then in hepatitis C becomes, where can we intervene? Where can we offer treatment to stop this paradigm or disease progression as I'm showing you? And in this very simple slide, I'm really highlighting that if we go in where we have evidence of chronic hepatitis, abnormal liver enzymes, detectable viremia, HPV DNA. We should be thinking about offering treatment to these people. And one of the things that I've focused on in recent years is trying to offer treatment much earlier in the course of chronic hepatitis B and therefore prevent these downstream sequelae or complications of chronic hepatitis B like cirrhosis and the development of liver cancer. Again, some numbers, we talked about the numbers in the, the very first slide I showed you, but we estimate approximately 800,000 deaths per year from chronic hepatitis B. These are largely related um, to liver cancer. And you will see here that HB infection accounts for the majority of liver cancer deaths worldwide with approximately 56%. And down here on the bottom right, uh, the, the pie chart I'm showing you, 10 to 25% of patients in our clinic will have a lifetime risk of HCC um, in those patients seen with chronic hepatitis B. So really quite staggering numbers, really underlying the necessity for us to 
engage those patients very early on. As I kind of talk about, you know, delivering disease assessment, stratification, identifying those patients who need treatment and who are likely to benefit most and trying to really, uh, you know, mitigate against those factors which are driving the development of advanced fibrosis, cirrhosis and liver cancer. Important factors to, to think about as a patient with hepatitis B or as a, as a healthcare professor managing patients with hepatitis B, host factors are really important in terms of disease progression, liver cancer, male sex, patients tend to do worse, age over 40, family history of HCC, and where you're born, sub-Saharan Africa or in Asia. The viral and disease factors that we need to think about, as I said, advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis significantly increases your risk. And we want to offer treatment to prevent that in the first place. Elevated HPV DNA, reflecting ongoing viral replication. And now we're looking at thresholds of just over 2000 international units that we could consider treating patients with levels of viremia around this. Elevated liver enzymes is telling us quite often that there's ongoing liver inflammation, prolonged time to age and seroconversion, the development of VNH and negative chronic hepatitis B associated with worse outcomes and certain genotypes such as genotype C. But in hepatitis B, like hepatitis C, the treatment field is beginning to change and evolve and moving away from nuke on treatment virally suppressed patients, many of whom we see in clinic who are managed really quite successfully by, by suppressing the virus, the treatment goal now is the loss of surface antigen. Can we achieve loss of surface antigen and by doing so significantly reduce the rates of development of cirrhosis, significantly reduce the rates for the development of liver cancer. And if we can achieve surface antigen loss, we can even look to potentially discharge patients from the clinic. So this is really where all the focus is in chronic hepatitis B as we move towards this surface antigen loss or what we describe as functional cure. And this cartoon that I put up here is not to uh, scare you, but to show you that the amount of work which is underway is part of this functional cure program. So if you look at the top half of this slide, what I'm showing you here are all the viral targets that we're looking at, such as entry inhibitors, silencing or siRNAs, uh, HPV DNA polymerase inhibitors, uh, some new drugs that you will have heard about more recently, capsid assembly inhibitors, secretion inhibitors. So all of these are focused on how we target the virus. And on the bottom half of this slide, I'm showing you on how we can target the host. And how we target the host are new therapies such as therapeutic vaccine currently in, in trials across the UK at the moment, uh, a number of immune modulators. In here, you can even include things like pegylator interferon, which has kind of lost its way a little bit, but maybe on it, may, maybe uh, considered again in terms of combination ter therapies for the treatment of hepatitis B, novel T, t cell therapies, and new therapies that are probably emerging or maybe transferred across from oncology, such as checkpoint inhibitors and other novel agents. But essentially, this cartoon is to show you that in order to achieve this functional cure, we will need a combination of uh, targeting both the virus and the host immune response to achieve this restoration of, of functional um, immune control of the virus, which we do see people can achieve with acute hepatitis B, where we resolve hepatitis B by loss of surface antigen. So the focus on hepatitis B will be about trying to achieve surface antigen loss or functional cure. And just to extend that a little bit more, that there are many studies now which are focusing on broadening treatment candidacy in hepatitis B, which I talked about a little bit earlier on. Ourselves and other people have published data showing a number of reasons and a number of factors from uh, 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 the, the, the determination or the demonstration of a host immune response, which may be more favorable in younger people, the uh, presence of viral integration in hepatitis B at quite a young age. And when we see all of these factors, this really makes the case for broadening treatment candidacy in hepatitis B and looking at that kind of model even that we have in hepatitis C now, identify, diagnose, and consider treating. But there's work to be done to get to that. I said I would finish on hepatitis delta or HDV infection. This to me is a virus which has really been neglected for, for some time, but now is coming back, is coming very much into the mainstream again as we look at it. And there's a key reason for this, and that is that there are new therapies which are emerging, which I'll come to in a little bit. But essentially, we think 
estimates somewhere between 12 million people who are co-infected with Delta virus, maybe up as, as, as high as 20 or 25 million people. But with Delta virus, it's a much more aggressive infection and 50 to 70% of co-infected patients will develop cirrhosis in five to 10 years after diagnosis. This is threefold higher than we see in hepatitis B. And these are really staggering numbers demonstrating one, the very aggressive nature of Delta hepatitis and two, the fact that at present, we've really not been able to offer people treatment. And that really is, is, is you know, grossly suboptimal in 2021. And that's why we need to move this field forward. I did mention that up until last year, there were no specific treatments for Delta virus. Interestingly, we've used pegylase interferon. It's in, it's in international and national guidelines as a recommended treatment, but the use of pegylase interferon for Delta was actually an off-label use. And and that's something important for us to consider. But there is hope because there are a number of novel anti-HDB compounds emerging. There are three of those in various stages of clinical trials and more advanced trials. But in 2020, last year, Bulevertide was, was approved for conditional marketing in Europe in 2020. And since last year, Bulevertide has been used for the treatment of Delta virus. There's emerging data from real world data in clinical trials which shows that bulevertide is actually very successful in achieving a reduction in HDV, or HDV RNA, and normalization of liver enzymes. And this is a key step for us in managing or offering really a suitable or optimal treatment for the management of Delta virus. I want to finish by just highlighting to you, uh, certainly as the healthcare professionals on the webinar, that if you have a patient who's found to be hepatitis B, surface antigen positive. It's my practice and it's something that I recommend that we should test all of our patients who are surface antigen positive for Delta antibody. This is the starting point. If the patient tests Delta antibody positive, then the patient should have a reflex test for Delta RNA. And that Delta RNA is positive, that reflects Delta viremia. And when there's Delta viremia, there's active Delta infection and this does need to be treated. So a simple approach here is patients who are surface antigen positive, I would advocate, as many people would, testing for Delta antibody positive, if possible, even reflex testing for Delta antibody positive. If the Delta antibody is positive, we test for Delta RNA. We look at the disease profile, the abnormal liver enzymes, Delta RNA. These patients should be offered treatment for Delta viremia. And I've just described to you, we have some novel therapies emerging and hopefully we'll have access to Bulevertide in the UK shortly. And this will be really, really important for all our Delta patients in the UK. Finally, a couple of notes of caution. While we want to assess Delta infection, we may use fiber scan, but the data for the use of fiber scan in Delta viremia is not quite there. This will emerge as we uh, undertake fiber scan in more patients as we move forward. But regrettably, liver histology remains the gold standard for the assessment of liver disease in patients with Delta uh, viremia. And remember that these patients with Delta viremia are often younger patients and they have significant hepatitis and can often have significant liver disease. So we really need to focus on in the coming years on our Delta, uh, uh, Delta virus patients. I want to finish, this is my last slide, by saying save a life, test someone for hepatitis B, C, and Delta. Uh, the, the field, as I've shown you, is changing rapidly. Uh, the functional cure program in hepatitis B is really, really uh, now ramping up in terms of the number of therapies moving into clinical trials that the majority of us in the UK should have access to, and that's really important. And hot on the heels of that, We've got new therapies for Delta, and also I envisage that we will see some of the novel therapies for the functional cure program in hepatitis B also being transferred over into the treatment of hepatitis Delta virus. I'd like to finish by just acknowledging Graham Foster and Ahmed uh, El Shakari for uh, their help with some of these slides that I present today. Thank you very much, uh, and it's a pleasure uh, sharing this presentation. And um, I look forward to the discussion. Which just leaves me to say uh, thank you so much for a very informative uh, and interesting update. It's already prompted a few questions, which we'll get to uh, a little bit later.
I'd now like to welcome David Graham Scott to the webinar. Thank you, David, for agreeing to be part of our World Hepatitis Day webinar today. We really appreciate it. And I'm sure people are going to get a lot from you sharing your experience with us. So you're here as someone who has been successfully treated for hepatitis C. Uh, mm -hmm. Before we talk about the expectations you had before treatment versus the realities of the treatment you received, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about how you came to have hepatitis C, please. OK. Um, <clears throat> the, basically, is the <clears throat> journey of a serious drug user. Um, though not one without hope, I um, immersed myself into the uh, drug addict subculture of Edinburgh in the mid-1980s. And really what propelled me forward into that was the old uh, ones of uh, anxiety, depression, uh, feeling very isolated. Um, for some reason, I, I, I find it hard to um, assess now exactly what was going on in my head, but to feel part of something, I got involved with a uh, serious drug culture <clears throat> and um, if anything I wanted to be a drug injecting person <laughs> I, um, it, it, it's it's it sounds bizarre why would you want that but that's what I wanted I was so um, unhappy with the world very complex reasons for that but I immersed myself into that particular subculture um, and I did feel part of something, maybe not something very good as far as most people are concerned, but uh, I felt a certain kind of camaraderie and connection with people that I was struggling with. Yeah. When I was a university graduate, that could have gone on to get a decent job, but I just struggled. I mean, I couldn't find work after university. I went to suddenly so got my degree, uh, BA honours in uh, history of art and film. But I just couldn't find a way forward. I felt aimless. Just for everything I was going for, I, I got knocked back for jobs and I just embraced being hopeless. Thank you for being so frank because I think that will resonate with with some if not all of the people that, that are watching today. Absolutely. There's no doubt that I wanted to become part of something. I certainly did feel part of something for a while. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I would say that I contracted hepatitis C around about 1984 or 85. At that time, they didn't know about hepatitis C. I think something came up with a test that I did two or three years later when I got tested. Quite a lot of people were getting tested for HIV. I wasn't quite sure what this was, but eventually when information came out about hepatitis C, somewhere maybe in the early 90s or mid 90s, um, I thought it was likely that I might have it. Um, I basically got it. I'm, I'm pretty sure I got it from a shared syringe. Yeah. Now at that time I was struggling myself with uh, depression and such like, and I thought anything that would propel me further into that darkness, I just didn't want to be part of. And I thought, I really feared it. Yeah. I was really, really worried about doing hep C treatment. So I wonder if um, when you finally did, did go forward for treatment, you know, what, what was the difference between what you'd been led to believe might happen and what actually the, the treatment consisted of? I spoke to a mental health nurse um, in WIC and she was very reassuring. I'd said, look, something changed in my head and I, I I just wasn't so 
uptight about it all. Yeah. I thought, I've got to do this now. Yeah. Went and got the test for hep C. I'd been putting this all off all along, getting the test. I got the test. And when it came back, she said, oh, you better sit down. Somebody, you know, the old... I said, don't worry about it. Or, you know, you don't have to get the box of tissues out. I know I'm going to have hep C. Might as well tell me. She said, yeah, yeah, okay, you do. I said, well, that's fine. I kind of expected that. Yeah. But she explained, the way she explained the treatment, and I like this woman, you know, I just, you know, when you get a rapport with a, a nurse or a specialist, yeah. I felt something about this, this particular person that um, I trusted her and her judgment. And I think that's an important thing if you have a good uh, practitioner of whatever it might be, nursing or, or, or psychiatry or psychology or uh, any number of uh, um, areas of expertise. Uh, it really matters. She very succinctly explained and gave me a good example of a person without naming them, a person of a similar age that had been a very serious drug user who had undergone this treatment with Maverick. It's called, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it properly, but these tablets and had successfully completed the treatment uh, with no signs of the hepatitis C being in his system. So that gave me hope. Instead of giving the example of somebody that was two and much younger, much healthier, maybe, yeah. um, she gave me an example of a man around the same age, which I thought was brilliant. Yeah, You've got to kind of look at the picture, you know, the wider picture of who you have in front of you, how you, uh, <clears throat> how you deal with that uh, client or patient. That made a big difference, and that sold it to me when she said that um, patient X dealt with it really well with no serious side effects, no uh, mental health concerns during the treatment, and no um, physical uh, uh, concerns either. I have to say, I. <laughs> But quite often the way I describe it is it was a doddle, you know, it was easy going. I didn't find it impacted upon me at all. You know, when you wake up someday or you feel tired during the day, I kind of sometimes blamed it on the treatment saying, oh, it's this stuff. But I get days like that anyway. I think most people do. Yeah. I think the treatment, I mean, I didn't find any serious side effects at all. So would you say Next you have a, a relatively normal life while, while undergoing the treatment, David? Absolutely. I went to work and I've got a very stressful job. I, I'm a news reporter. It really is a job that uh, you need to be very much together in. Yeah. But I found it didn't impair me whatsoever. I was able to function, <clears throat> do the job, didn't take any time off because of it, um, drive a car, it didn't affect me that way, um, socialise with people, um, and it wasn't like I was lying sleeping in bed all the time, I um, just quite normal. And on the understanding that things might have changed again since you've been treated yourself, is there anything about the treatment that you think it would be useful for, for someone to know that we, we haven't talked about yet? Well, I think the fact is that what you might have heard is that people have to do injections into the abdomen or whatever. I mean, I, I, I don't know if there is a treatment using injections, but the tablets are easy going there there's there's nothing uh, to fear with it at all 
I would really suggest people do it. And years ago, I thought, what's the point? What's the point of going and doing a treatment that makes you feel like killing yourself? Or mm. so many people just stop partway through two months into a, a year long uh, treatment program. Um, I just thought, what's the point? And quite a few people just gave up. Certainly put me off. And I was frightened of getting a hep C test because of that fear that there's no, what's the point in doing it when you can't handle doing the treatment? And to do a year long program with interferon and whatever the other medication was and try and work, because I've always worked. Um, I, I just didn't want to take a year off just lying about. Um, I think it would have made me really, really depressed as well. My life has turned around immensely in the last few years. I've got a job now that, um, as I said, uh, it's it's all encompassing. I have to help throughout the day, working on doing photographs and writing and um, thinking up new ideas for a, an article. And I like it. I really like doing it. So I, I get pleasure from that. I've also met a partner that I'm very happy with um, that I met recently. Uh, we bought a house together. We're moving there, and it's a nice kind of idyllic part of the Caithness countryside here. Um, there's a lot of things happened. Positive things happened with me in the last few years. There's been depths as well. Quite honestly, there's been depths. But gradually, uh, sorry, overall, I would say it's been a, a kind of uphill a movement and um, I'm very pleased about that. I mean I never would say to people I'm really happy with life but I quite often say that now. I was very unhappy for a lot of my life. Great. So oh, yeah. it's it's been life changing you know it's the whole thing together Yeah. Um, and I'm not just saying that for uh, your your webinar or seminar, I genuinely feel much happier. And that's really good to hear. And again, thank you for being so frank. So just yeah. now you're in a position where you can sort of think back to the time when you were untested and, and untreated. What yeah. would you say to anyone who is either putting off getting tested or is still just a bit too reluctant to, to go and seek treatment? There's nothing to fear with this. Um, would you say that overall, were you treated with care and respect by the staff you encountered when you were receiving your treatment? Oh, 110,000%. They were great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gina, the mental health nurse, fantastic. Absolutely great woman. Uh, the other nurse that came and did the, the bloods, uh, great. Another great woman. Really, really sympathetic, uh, kind, and supportive. Great. I can't say enough about these people. Um, and I've been around a bit where I've been in cities and experienced doctors and mental health people. And it took me to come back to my hometown after all these years and meet people from a very tiny little highland community that I felt much more part of and embraced, we could say. And they, they helped me a lot. Hopefully somebody will find uh, a nurse or um, support mechanism that will see them through as well. I think it matters. And if they can be told uh, a similar story of an individual that you can relate to, i.e. I was told about a man of similar age, similar uh, uh, history of, of drug usage, then um, 
that can help a lot as well. So, uh, yeah. I, yeah. I think, well, that's, I've covered all the things that I'd like to cover, but is there anything else you haven't had a chance to say that you'd like to add, David, or have you you've got everything what you wanted to say in as well? Well, I'm happy about that. You know, it's people are, I, I've always welcomed, welcomed people to come and find me on Facebook or social media somewhere. I've, I've made films, they can leave a comment. People are welcome to find me and I don't hide anything about uh, aspects of my life because I've struggled. Um, I've really struggled. Um, and I'm really not struggling anymore. I didn't think that would be possible. I'm really not struggling anymore. And I um, think that would be a lovely place to, to end because that's a, that's a lovely uh, ending message. So on that note, I'd just like to thank you once again for, for agreeing to take part today. And I'm sure many people will feel encouraged to get tested and treated after listening to your experiences. Thanks, Julie. Such a powerful message there for, for anyone who's thinking about getting tested or treated and for those of us that, that work with them. So now we're going to move on to the question and answer session. Uh, we can see that we've had quite a few coming in over the last half an hour or so. So if David and Patrick would care to sort of unmute themselves and pop their cameras on, we'll sort of make a start with that. There we go. So uh, we've got some short questions and some long ones, so I'll try and mix it up a little bit. So first one is for you, Patrick. Um, are the new elimination initiatives UK wide, please? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'd, I'd like to echo uh, the sentiments from many people uh, about David's story, which I, I think is really remarkable. And, um, and it's fantastic that David uh, has come on and give us that insight because to me it really highlights to people living with viral liver disease that if you go out and you engage that there's the possibility of treatments and success and what he described about feeling so good in himself which I think is remarkable I'd like to thank David for, for, for sharing all that with us. Um, absolutely this is about Elimination, the elimination targets are global elimination targets. So every corner of the UK, we should really be focusing on trying to achieve elimination. I think they are, you know, this is not going to be easy. I think there will certainly be a, a huge amount of effort, both, both on healthcare professional side, uh, you know, across the board from from primary care to secondary care to, to viral hepatitis nurses to advocates. I think it's going to be a huge effort with all of us working in tandem to try and achieve this, this um, elimination targets. But we're duty bound to do this because if we don't, we have people living with uh, chronic viral conditions, with disease which progresses, which disease ultimately can lead to chronic liver disease, end-stage liver disease, liver failure, and liver cancer. So this is about, I would say, a concerted effort about everybody really trying to do as much as they can to focus on case finding, engagement, engagement with patients, disease assessment, offering treatment. And, and you know, the treatments, D D David is, is, is testifying to you know, relatively recent treatments in hepatitis C able to uh, eradicate the virus and move on and get back to a normal lifestyle. Hepatitis C is a fantastic exemplar of that. We're not there in hepatitis B, meaning there's a lot of work to do as part of this functional cure program with clinical trials and engagement with clinical trials, which we also need to follow. But I think uh, hepatitis C and, and, and David's story really is, is an exemplar of the potential successes. Okay, and if we move on to one of our other questions, one of, one of our viewers has asked, will they always test positive for HB? For hepatitis B? Yeah, I, I guess that's what it is. So, so I mean, if you, if, if for example, um, let's say you're in the clinic today with hepatitis B, and let's say you're on treatment, like a nucleoside, nucleoside analog, we suppress the virus and the virus becomes undetectable. So the HPV DNA should be undetectable, but the person will test hepatitis B surface antigen positive 
which is the marker of the antigen which reflects chronic infection. The new treatments are about trying to achieve surface antigen loss. And if they achieve surface antigen loss or what we refer to as functional cure, and they achieve functional cure, well, then they will no longer test hepatitis B surface antigen positive. So that's where the new treatments are trying to get to. So people won't always test hepatitis B surface antigen positive, provided they reach that functional cure status. Okay, and then one for you, David. Um, let's see where it is there. So after being reluctant, a bit hesitant to get treated yourself, what do you think can be done? Is there anything that can be done to better spread the message so that more people do come forward for, for treatment from a, from a patient's point of view? What, what do you think might work? Uh, thanks, Julie. Um, well, I think what we're doing today is opening it up to a wider audience. Um, it seems to me from the questions coming through that some of the people on board today are people that may possibly have hepatitis C and were possibly drug users or, or got it from some other uh, uh, way. And um, I think that's good. I think that also there probably still exists a number of um, uh, people that had heard about the previous uh, treatment with interferon. And um, correct me if I'm, I'm saying that wrong, but um, that was known to be a very invasive treatment that put a lot of people off. I had heard stories about it and quite honestly, I was scared of it. And I decided not to go ahead with that. I felt that something would come along that would be easier going since there, um, there have been treatments for Hep B that I believe are, are, are much easier to handle. And I guess I just waited around for that to happen. And so, yes, I think it's, it's great what's happening here. I'm quite happy to help in the future um, to help inform people. And um, yeah, that's, that's, that's all really good. But I never used to mention, it was, it was a banned word for me or words, hep, C. I was terrified of it. Just have a quick look in the chat when you get a minute, Dave. There's a, there's a lot of love for you in the, in the chat box of being so oh. today with your story. Uh, Tell them to watch my films. <laughs> a couple more technical questions for, for Dr. Kennedy. Um, somebody's been told that being put on a good diet can help put Hep B into remission. Is that true? Well, a good diet is good for everything um, because we're healthier, uh, you know, we are stronger physically, immunologically better. So a good diet is very important, but a good diet is not a treatment per se for getting hepatitis B into remission. Um, you know, the counter argument to that is that a bad diet can lead to inflammation through other factors around maybe steatohepatitis or inflammation related to fat or fatty liver disease or all those factors. So a good diet per se is not enough to get you into remission, but a good diet is critical in order to have a healthy liver, which means that if there are other factors which are driving disease progression, such as hepatitis B, that the good diet at least is helping us in some way. I think it's really important for people, and, and I understand people's question around, what can I do from a lifestyle perspective, from a diet, can I reduce my alcohol intake? All of these clearly help. All of these clearly are advantageous to us. All of these clearly will be beneficial to us, to our liver and general health. But a good diet alone is not enough for the treatment of hepatitis B and getting hepatitis B into remission. And that's where people like me in my clinic, seeing people are able to advise people on the best treatment approaches for them to get virus into remission. And as I said, talked about functional cure, about actually achieving surface engine loss and really moving um, hepatitis B forward in terms of treatment outcomes. Okay, and then 
perhaps a more technical one again. Uh, one of the clients that's being supported was put on medication because of uh, the age, which was 60 plus, and the family history of Hep B. Although the HB SAG is still low, she wonders, is this really a good prevent prevention measure? So if, if I understand the question correctly, um, and I'm just looking at it, um, medication, family history of hepatitis B, although the hepatitis B is still low. So look, if you have hepatitis B surface antigen, and if your, let's say, viral load is low, your risk is lower. But if we reduce to the viral load to being undetectable, and if there's a family history of progressive disease or cirrhosis or liver cancer, taking that antiviral medication to keep the virus uh, undetectable is really important and it's gonna help that individual. But I'm just a little bit curious about the question because the surface antigen is low. Surface antigen is a test that we measure, but it's not kind of a mainstream test in terms of its quantity. Um, so I'm assuming maybe the person here is talking about viral load and reducing the viral load is always beneficial. And if there's a family history of cirrhosis related to, lip, to hepatitis B or liver cancer, taking antiviral medication to suppress the virus is also really important. Okay, and then a more general question. Uh, we, someone feels that the public have a very low awareness of hepatitis in general. Would you say that GPs are aware of who is at risk and how to test? And what do you think is the priority to, to increase testing in those cases? Um, personally, I'm, I'm completely in agreement that I think awareness is um, too low. I think uh, in certain primary care GP practices, awareness may also be low. I think it's the job of people like me and others to try and raise awareness as much as possible. And I think a webinar like this is really important in, in, in terms of, of doing that. But you know, raising awareness is, is, is a continuous process and a continuous effort. And I spend all my try time trying to raise awareness, trying to engage people, trying to remove the barriers and trying to reassure people that if you're engaged in a clinic, in a specialist clinic under specialist care, you will be in a very good position where a lot of the concerns and the worries and the stigma and all of those things can be dealt with in a much better way with the support of the healthcare professionals. And that's why I really think it's important. Um, engagement is critical. David's story is, is, is remarkable in showing us that. And, and it's, it's just one part of the jigsaw kind of that I really want to push out to people to say, you know, the clinics, specialist clinics are there to see people, engage with people and assess their disease and really give them clear information about the disease, which I worry sometimes they don't have. Okay, we've probably got time for just, just a couple more. So I, uh, there's a shorter question at the end there. Do transmission rates need to be reduced to achieve the elimination targets? From me, the short answer to that is absolutely they do. And again, that's about awareness, uh, engagement, healthcare engagement, GPs, primary care, all the way into secondary care. But absolutely, we need to break that transmission rate for to meet the targets. Okay, and a slightly meaty one. So bearing in mind the reinfection that you've mentioned and the difficulty in finding some patients and the reluctance of other patients to engage, do you think we're actually going to reach that elimination hep C target by 2030? It's a good question. I think I said at the outset that these are quite, you know, that, that, that quite, uh, you know, quite high we can say, well, because, you know, engagement isn't what it should be, dissemination of information isn't what it should be, reinfection rates are, you know, uh, will go against us. I mean, yeah, these are factors, these are, ob these are obstacles, but we need to, as, as a community, we need to overcome these obstacles. We need to work much more closely together. The kind of barriers between patients and healthcare professionals really need to disappear. We need to really join forces if we are to be successful in terms of achieving the elimination targets. This, this won't be achieved by people like me in a secondary care setting. It won't be achieved by GPs alone. It really is about everybody 
and patients and patient advocates and groups like the British Liver Trust working in concert to try and achieve this. Okay, we've just got a very early question that came in that we haven't got around to answering for an individual. Will the outcome of this person's biopsy be affected by the steroids that they're taking? Um, if it's a biopsy for viral liver disease, firstly, the patient shouldn't really be on steroids. We wouldn't expect somebody to be on steroids if they have liver disease. If, um, cut a long story short, the biopsy would did still tell us about the amount of scarring of the liver. Uh, the biopsy would still tell us about inflammation related to the virus. So there's still information from the biopsy, but there are probably some subtleties to that question that we're not quite aware of, which would probably be best addressed towards the healthcare professional or doctor who was requesting the biopsy in, in the first place. Okay, thanks ever so much. And I think we have going to have to leave it there with, with the, the questions. Uh, I'd just like to sort of bring the webinar to a close. Um, and firstly, thank again our speakers for, for making the time to, to be with us today. We really appreciate uh, that. Um, to end, I'd like to restate the key messages of World Hepatitis Day this year and ask what we can all do next. The reality remains that, that many people with hepatitis simply don't know that they have it and some that do are still reluctant to seek treatment for, for lots of reasons, many of which we, we've touched on today. So our messages are simple. We, we don't wait to get tested. New and improved treatments are available. And even in this continuing COVID situation, we simply can't wait to act on viral hepatitis. So we call on anyone who might be living with viral hepatitis uh, and is unaware to, to, to try and get tested. We call on people who are already living with hepatitis to seek access to the treatment and support available. And we call on all our fellow professionals and, and fellow decision makers to work with us and to make hepatitis, hepatitis elimination a reality. We'd ask people to, to visit our website if they're after further information uh, and support. Uh, please watch out for that post webinar blog, which we should get posted up early next week. And thank you all for coming. We hope you've enjoyed it and have a great rest of the afternoon.